I'd like to thank you both for your work and your collaboration with the public, uh, private, and social sector in Nigeria. Uh, as John said, uh, MacArthur Foundation was the first to support our presidential anti-corruption effort and worked with us on several other governance and human capital development initiatives. And Hafsa, thank you uh, for the invitation to participate in this conversation today. I think it's fair to say that I have uh, a uh, more than sentimental attachment to this very day, uh, International Women's Day, because it also happens to be my birthday. <laughs> but uh, I'd also to say uh, to Hafsad and the Women in Africa Initiative, uh, you must not imagine that the irony of this all-male panel is lost on any of us uh, <laughs> who are here on this panel. We know that women are being set up for some accountability, you know, and I think we're already given a reasonably good account of ourselves so far. I must also bring you the warm personal greetings of Nigeria's president, uh, President Muhammadu Buhari, on this uh, International Women's Day. Uh, incidentally, uh, Mr. President enjoys the distinction of the honor of the champion of the He For She campaign in Nigeria. Uh, that was conferred on him a couple of years ago. Indeed, as father of seven well-educated and confident daughters, he really does believe that he, more than anyone else, should be a passionate advocate of gender equality. And so should I. I also have two daughters, uh, Adam Lola and Koinsola. They're both young adults and uh, been out of university for a while now. And they've been entrepreneurs even while they were in school. But more importantly, from the day that they were born, they could assume that they would have equal legal, social, and political status and rights as their brother and as any other male. This is so because they were born to educated and modestly uh, economically successful parents. I'm sure that that is the case for many of us here in this conversation and many who have daughters in this particular, who are, you know, in this, in this webinar. Our daughters are educated or being educated and can and will compete favorably with their male counterparts anywhere. They will aspire and can attain political leadership by virtue of the privileges of, and circumstances of their birth they are positioned to break uh, the glass ceilings in commerce, in the profession, and politics. But the story of the daughters of those of us who are here is not the story of the large number of girls in countries all over, in countries all over Africa, and in particular in Nigeria. Over 35% of girls on the average are illiterate. And illiteracy means that they will not find decent, well-paying jobs that they will in many cases be married off early. Many will be discriminated against in inheritance rights or punitive widowhood practices. They'll work hardest on the farms and they'll work long hours in the markets, but would always earn less than men. So these historical deficits ensure that women will be underrepresented in leadership as well, whether that be business or political leadership or leadership in any of the sectors, almost invariably they will be behind. But even the educated will probably several times in their working lives be subjected to one form of gender-based discrimination or the other. Many may even add to the growing statistics of victims of domestic violence. So for many generations, I think women have fought these manifestations of gender inequality. And in Nigeria and in Africa in particular, you know, this has been the case too. Over time, that struggle has been refined to the level of a right to gender equality. And that notion that women and men should have the same legal, social, and political rights. It's this body of rights, which uh, you know, is, uh, is today described as, as, uh, as feminism. But I think as something has changed in the past few years, Women are now saying that the fight for gender equality is not just for women and girls alone. And I think that this is the right approach. It's a fight for all of us, especially men. Uh, but the campaign is much more important 
in shaping the future. Men are now being challenged to stand shoulder to shoulder with women in the struggle for gender equality. And I think we're all learning that insisting on equal rights for women is an imperative of justice, is, uh, and for fairness, is an entitlement, a debt which uh, I think generations are owed to women and, uh, and girls, and it's not a gift. Uh, this is perhaps, in my view, I mean, I think the realization of, of, of the imperative of this notion is perhaps the greatest leap of development in contemporary history. And, and I do not mean in any way to demean any of what has happened in technology or elsewhere. But I think that that uh, a change, uh, not just in laws, but in mindsets and conventions, is perhaps one of the most dramatic things that have happened, uh, especially in the last uh, decade or so. Which is why today that the theme uh, uh, choose to challenge biases and misconceptions in favor of a more uh, gender inclusive world. It's a very apt one. But I'd like to suggest that the most effective challenge that can be mounted is education of girls. I think that that's about the most effective thing that we could do. And anyway, from the point of view of the public sector, that's absolutely the most important thing to do. There's no question that this is the single most potent game changer in the story. Not only does it provide options for economic empowerment for women, but it also ensures that their children will be educated, that they will not be married off too early with their attendant health and population implications. Uh, the, uh, the president, uh, President Muhammad Buhari, president of Nigeria, underscored this point uh, uh, sometime in 2019 while speaking to governors of the states. Uh, for those of us who may not be familiar with the uh, structure of the Nigerian uh, state, we, we actually have semi-autonomous, or almost autonomous states. So it's a federation with states, and the states have responsibility for primary and secondary education, although, of course, the, the federal government uh, frequently chips into that. But while speaking uh, to the governors, he, he uh, talked in particular about free and compulsory education which, by the way, is law in Nigeria, right? In fact, there is a law, Compulsory Free Universal Basic Education Act, which provides that every government in Nigeria shall provide free, compulsory, and universal basic education for every child of primary and junior secondary school age. And it is also a crime for any parent to keep his child or a child out of school for this period. So, so the, the real issue then, and he, he went on to say that in, in his view, when a government fails to provide schools, teachers, and teaching materials necessary for education, such a government is actually aiding and abetting that crime. And I think it's important, you know, uh, that uh, the law does not discriminate. As a matter of fact, the law expects that, uh, that both boys and girls especially at uh, the primary level, will be given education compulsory. So I think the enforcement of, of that particular legislation is one uh, that um, uh, we, we're challenged uh, uh, to, 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 to do and to activate, and is one which, uh, at the level of the Nigerian Economic Council, which is a meeting, a monthly uh, meeting of governors of the various states, of which I have the privilege of chairing, we frequently monitor what is going on in, in education of children and in particular education of girls. And there are several initiatives around uh, education of girls, and especially in the states where uh, girl-child education is particularly disadvantaged. Undoubtedly, improving access to education and ensuring that there is uptake requires more than just providing uh, these decisions. As you can see, it's obviously more than just law and is more than just policy. There are normative factors involved in transforming cultural attitudes around the education of women. So it's about interacting directly with communities and ensuring that parents understand the value of educating their children, especially their daughters. It is about ensuring that homes are also safe, that the apprehensions of parents and guardians are addressed, that the availability of safe and supportive learning environments for our girls exist, 
And in a country that is so ethnically and religiously diverse, this approach will differ in communities across the country. Not just communities, but also across all sectors, all levels you know, of the country. So transforming ignorant and sexist attitudes that hold women back would definitely engage, uh, would definitely involve engaging influential religious, traditional community leaders, and supporting progressive civil society organizations, as well as empowering and training, uh, especially female role models and teachers, uh, and improving enrollment and retention rates. And there's a project that I've been working on uh, with, uh, a, with, a, with a group of people in the Northeast Nigeria. Uh, it, it started off as um, a school for many of the young children who were, um, who were dislocated on account of the uh, problems in the Northeast. Now this school has a fairly large number of girls. I think it's just about half the number of girls and, and, and boys. But at some point we discovered that the girls uh, were saying that they wanted to go off to get married. And many of them, of course, were under the age of 16. And they were just actively, you know, many of them were saying that they would like to go out and get married. Because culturally, it's, it's the way to go. And you know, because that has been a dominant culture, after a few, after all of you know, after a while, people start to think that they are at that age left on the shelf. So it was so, so it was becoming a major concern. And but just to talk to the question of female role models, I have uh, very many uh, ladies who work with me who I thought were would be role models to them, and two or three of them actually went over to speak to these girls in the schools in, uh, in, 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 in Maiduguri, in Northeast Nigeria. And they were able to persuade them that the right way to go was to get educated and be like them, you know, but like these uh, ladies who uh, were already, of course, accomplished and was married, had children, but were also able to take care of themselves and take care of, of their children and, you know, be reckoned with, as it were, in society. So I think it's very important to have strong female uh, role models, just as it's important to encourage uh, uh, education of girls, but also more importantly, to um, deconstruct these, um, uh, th these ideas that um, young women must uh, be married early. And, and this is so uh, on account of culture and in some cases on account of religious practices. So if we devoted our energy solely to this cause, and that's the education of girls, I think we will deal a decisive blow to this problem and dramatically in the process reduce poverty and, and health risks. The other point I'd like to make is, you know, the affirmative empowerment of women, economically or otherwise. In my opinion, uh, affirmative empowerment is as much about giving options as it is giving them the means, you know. So it's not just about options, also the means. Our social investment program, uh, which is the largest of its kind, uh, at least in Sub-Saharan Africa, focused deliberately on giving women a, uh, more equal opportunities. 56% of the beneficiaries of our, what is called the Government em uh, Enterprise and Empowerment Program, or about 1.5 million women, have been empowered by our microcredit schemes. So the vast majority of those who benefit from the microcredit schemes are actually uh, women, uh, 1.5 million of them in, in total now. 500,000 beneficiaries of the Empower Graduate, this is a graduate scheme, it's called Empower, a graduate scheme, there are 500,000 of them. 45% of those beneficiaries are, fem are female. And then for the conditional cash transfers, which are tr cash transfers given uh, to uh, very poor, 96% of beneficiaries are women. Now, the, the, the importance uh, of this program, uh, the conditional cash transfers, has demonstrated the resilience and focus of women. They receive uh, a stipend every month, about 5,000 naira every month. But what we've seen is that they continue to invest in their communities and grow their money. 
As of December 2020, they had formed almost 35,000 savings groups in 27 states. And I'm sure that some of us might have come across reports of women's groups in Sokoto State buying fairly used vehicles to facilitate their movement to hospitals for childbirth. In some other states, they've improved primary school infrastructure for their children or started small businesses with over 500,000 revolving loans borrowed from savings groups. These are women who get 5,000 Naira every month as part of the social investment scheme. They identify their own challenges. They focus on how to address them. And in response to the economic shocks of the pandemic in particular, and I, again, that's a whole topic on its own, but I just you know, mentioned some of what we we'll tried to do. Our payroll support for small businesses under the Economic Sustainability Plan, over 43% were women. There's a payroll support for, uh, for those, for many of the small businesses that were experiencing grave challenges on account of the uh, lockdowns and all that. For artisans also, 44% uh, were women. As you must already know, the heads of these uh, historic social investment programs are women. Uh, Mrs. Miriam Oasis is a uh, special advisor to the president on social investment programs. And now uh, the current minister for humanitarian uh, um, affairs, who, is, um, who handles all the social uh, in investment uh, uh, programs today, both of them, you know, are, are of course uh, women, and, uh, and no, no, no question at all why it is that they are very focused on ensuring that uh, they deliver on, on the, especially the affirmative empowerment programs. So let me say, as I conclude, that if we've learned anything at all in the past decade. It is that ensuring education and empowerment of women is an existential issue for us in Nigeria and indeed in Africa. A child of a mother who can read is 50% more likely to leave past the age of five for each additional uh, school year. Actually increases earnings of a woman by 20%. Two thirds less maternal deaths occur if mothers finish primary school, two thirds, fewer maternal deaths would occur if mothers actually finished primary school. So if we hold down half the, the productive segment of our nation, as it says, hold down half the sky, on account of culture or other frankly outdated considerations, we are much poorer and much more deprived as a whole. So holding down uh, women is holding down our societies. We do ourselves a favor by ensuring social and legal equality of women. Thank you very much.